So I wanted to make this video today to talk about improved forest management baselines. And uh, I wanted to do that because I've had a lot of conversations in the past couple of weeks with people who are doing improved forest management in the United States. And they think that they're good people. <laughs> but I want to I make clear uh, why improved forest management baselines are often deeply flawed. So one of the first mistakes that I think people make is that they come at this from a very human perspective. They're trying to put themselves in the place of the small landowner. And what they're doing is they're saying, well, this small landowner could have cut their trees. You know, Farmer Joe owns 100 hectares of land, and he can cut their tre his trees any time that he wants. So let's just give Farmer Joe uh, what he would get from timber in the form of carbon credits and make sure that Farmer Joe doesn't do that. It makes sense to me, right? But that math doesn't work out across the landscape. And, and now, you know, you can point out to these people that, you know, Farmer Joe hasn't touched his land in the past 40 years. You can look at the satellite imagery. Farmer Joe, like, hasn't been commercially harvesting his trees. And inevitably, the response will be, well, Farmer Joe could start doing that next year. Farmer Joe could die, and, and his kids could inherit it, and, and they could do it next year. Well, you know, ultimately, this math, it may work out well for this particular guy and in this particular scenario, but it doesn't work out at the landscape level. Because if you zoom out and you've suddenly got a thousand projects scattered across the landscape, the fact is, by claiming that each and every one of these guys was likely to cut their trees the very next year, uh, you are then creating this fantasy scenario where the landscape is just denuded of trees. You're creating the scenario where we just are going to go and cut down all of our trees next year. And that's just not the reality of the situation. The reality is, is that Farmer Joe might be able to cut his trees next year, but statistically speaking, he's not going to. And so here we have the challenge, because people think that Farmer Joe should be getting all of the carbon for the trees on his land, but, but really, he should be getting basically the average. And if he doesn't get the average, if he gets everything, then we end up with massive overissuance. And that basically describes the American carpenter industry right now. It describes a situation in which everybody is claiming that they would have immediately clear-cut their trees, uh, but this is just not a realistic outcome. You know, realistically, only a small number of Farmer Joes out there are actually going to cut their trees any given year. So realistically, what we need to do is, is estimate, you know, probabilistically where this forest was going to head. And what that leads us to doing is, is kind of taking an average. So, you know, if you've got a thousand Farmer Joes, maybe only, you know, a hundred of them were going to cut their trees in, in the near term future. Uh, therefore, everybody should maybe only be getting a tenth of the carbon on their landscape. Well, foresters do not like this idea at all. The, the, the biggest complaint that you'll hear, hear from crusty old foresters is, well, nobody's going to go and take off just a tenth of the, land, the trees on their land. You know, they'll, they'll claim that, like, we need a realistic harvest scenario to, to be issuing these credits. You'll claim that, you know, the only way to be doing this is, is to, to say you know, is to, to use FVS simulations to basically say, oh, oh okay, we're going to cut, cut and cut, you know, 60% of the trees. And they'll use silvicultural terms like, okay, we're going to do a two-stage shelter wood in this fantasy scenario that we're coming up with. But what we have to do for a protocol that enrolls a lot of different people's land is credit for what is going to happen across the regional average. And so, you can be as upset as you want. The fact is, we can't go and say that every single Farmer Joe is going to cut their trees down. And so uh, what happened in, I think, you know, kind of the next generation of, of, of carbon protocols is that people caught on to this. So you have other protocols, apart from the American Carbon Registry's awful protocol, uh, saying then, uh, okay, you know, a sensible thing to do is to assume that most forests are going to come to the average. And so for the Climate Action Reserve and for the California Air Resource Board protocols, uh, basically what you're allowed to do is you'll say, uh, okay, we, we, we're, we're at 150 tons of carbon. Uh, in all likelihood, Farmer Joe was going to uh, cut his trees down to the, the average amount of the region. So, so these two protocols, California Air Resource Board and Climate Action Reserve protocols, they're much better than the American Carbon Registry protocols. You get fewer credits usually. But here's the thing. These protocols also got it wrong. Because what they did was, was overly simplistic. They just diced the country up into something like 70 different ecosystems. And they said, okay, here's the average for each ecosystem. Uh, you're allowed to claim that your baseline is going to go down to the average of, of whatever ecosystem that you're in. Makes sense, right? 
Well, on the surface, it does make sense, but ecosystems are much more complicated than just a bunch of like 70 lines on the map. Uh, and so what people immediately started doing is they started putting their projects in the portions of the ecosystem that were most productive. And what they could do there then is, is if you've got an ecosystem that includes desert, it includes like semi-arid pine forests, uh, high altitude, you know, uh, alpine uh, mountain forests, and then also a bunch of redwoods, uh, obviously it's going to be more, more lucrative for you to claim carbon credits if you've got the land that has redwoods, because then all of a sudden you're, you're comparing to an average that's got like no trees on it. So what people started doing, of course, was clumping all of their projects towards the edges of these, these ecosystems. And, and what they ended, you know, there, there were entire geospatial companies devoted to like sleuthing out where carbon projects would be the most valuable within these ecosystems. Uh, so this all, this all blew up, you know, with carbon plan. The protocols haven't changed since then, but at least people are aware that you have to look for it. Uh, but the reverse kind of occurred too, because if you happen to have a forest in a, in a particularly unproductive part of your ecosystem, you know, in a particularly dry area or like kind of higher up on a mountain, uh, then you're screwed. You're never going to be able to get carbon credits because, you know, your forest is always going to kind of be below that average line. So this was a really, it was a really overly simplistic and kind of a, a, a poor way of doing it. That's stupid! Use your common sense! Um, so those are still on the books, and it's a better way of doing it than, than just claiming every single person would have clear-cut their trees. But it's still a bad way of doing it. So nobody's figured it out. Nobody's figured out how to report on what likely would have happened to a forest, uh, you know, at scale, right? Except we have a brand new protocol being put out there by the Nature Conservancy and Vera and the American Family Forest Foundation or whatever, I don't know. Uh, and, and basically what this protocol does is it takes a bunch of plots inside the, the forest and it matches them to government plots outside the forest based on a whole bunch of matching criteria like slope and, and productivity and, and you know, how, how big the trees are. And it just sees what happens to those plots that are matched over time. And it just follows those outcomes. And I have to say, this is one of the most bulletproof protocols that I have ever seen. I think this is going to you know, be reinvigorating for the improved forest management space. Because I can't really find any really terrible flaws in it. Now, one of the nicest things that occurred to me when reading this protocol is that this is one of the first protocols that I've ever seen that is entirely algorithmic. There's no opportunity for some scummy project developer to come and say, here's my project, this is how many credits I think I should get, give them to me now. And I want to keep, I want to point out that that is how every other Vera project works, right? Like the existing Vera protocols for like avoided deforestation and stuff, they all involve the person who's getting the credits in the end coming up with their own numbers for how many credits they should get. It's ridiculous. But we have here a completely algorithmic solution where it doesn't matter how good-hearted or evil the project developer happens to be, they're always going to get the same number. And so this is absolutely fantastic, right? I also think there's just a simple elegance. Uh, but it, it makes sense to, to match to other very similar parcels and very similar forest types and see what their outcomes are. But here's what really excites me about it. The fact is, in the United States, most of our forests are actually growing. We're actually accumulating carbon. And why is this? Well, it's because we were really cutting our trees down a lot in the 1970s and 80s. And in the 90s, uh, we, we kind of cracked down, made it more difficult to harvest trees off of federal land. And there was just kind of this shift in perceptions. So forests are accumulating carbon all across the country. What this means is that a lot of the time, the most likely outcome for Farmer Joe's forest is that it would have grown back anyway. The most likely outcome is that Farmer Joe is like, you know, maybe in like suburban Massachusetts, and he really doesn't have the option of clear cutting his trees. I mean, the, the local planning board would put up a massive fuss. So. You know, for, in these cases, we could actually end up with this protocol having a positive baseline. Let, let's think about that for a second. Somebody out there in the carbon world is finally acknowledging that the most likely outcome for a forest might be that it grows back anyway. And that doesn't mean that a project can't go ahead and still get credits. There are lots of ways that you can manage a forest to accumulate more carbon than the average. This just means that Farmer Joe's forest just needs to outperform uh, all of his neighbor's forests. 
Uh, and so I, I think this is incredibly conservative. You know, I've picked through like the comments left about this, this thing, and I don't see very many teeth there. But I do think one big concern is that additionality still needs to be accounted for. We still don't want like basically parks enrolling for carbon offsets. You know, this is only a, a baseline solution. It doesn't, it doesn't solve the fact that the Nature Conservancy could start enrolling areas that have been conserved for 100 years. This is what they've done in the past, and I do not want to see it happen again. So additionality is not solved for, but the baseline at least is going to be a realistic sampling of what likely would have happened to these areas. You know, I think one of the other problems that somebody pointed out is that, you know, there aren't enough government plots. That, this was a point somebody made in the, in the comment section of, of, of this protocol on Vera's website. Uh, this is the dumbest point I've ever heard. There are 62,000 plots in the United States. There are sure as hell enough plots to be doing, like, nearest neighbor matching in. So we're done with that one. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think the other people who are kind of upset about this are kind of the crusty old foresters who are saying, like, okay, like, nobody's realistically going to harvest just, like, 10% of their trees. But again, it's not about what, what this guy would have done if he was going to cut his trees down. It's about statistically what would, have, what would have happened across the landscape, across the population of farmers that are enrolled in this project. And so I think this is a mental disconnect that a lot of people have like going into these things. Uh, finally, the, the, one of the nicest things about this protocol is that the baseline is dynamic. And that means that we're not looking back at the past and kind of forecasting what's going to happen in the future. There's no like far flung outcomes of like, okay, like in, in 20 years, the, the area is just going to be a desolate wasteland. No, what's going to happen with this is that for every year that the project goes, it's just going to compare to the plots outside the project and it's just going to see what the difference is. And so if there's a change in politics, if there's a spruce budworm outbreak, whatever it may be, that's going to be reflected in the baseline as the project progresses. This baseline is going to be representative of whatever actual issues are being faced by that farmer at the time. And so I, you know, no matter how I look at this, in terms of the baseline at least, I am enormously optimistic about this protocol. You know, there are still, you know, other ways that people could be cheating. There are still like, you know, issues with like gerrymandering. Uh, you know, let's hope that like the plots are placed, you know, in a statistically valid way. But but ultimately, I think that this is one of the most bulletproof protocols on the market right now. So I'm very excited to see. Uh, hopefully, it kind of take off. Uh, people are going to get fewer credits. But you know what? Uh, we need to be issuing fewer credits. That's just kind of the the reality of the situation.